pleasant good morning to each one of you, and we greet you all in that wonderful and powerful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't it, isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Amen. <laughs> you know, these kind of Sunday morning. I'm so happy to see each one of you. Amen. And we just want to give him an oath of praise and an oath of thanks for who he is this morning. Heavenly Father, most righteous God, as we come before your throne of grace one more time, Father, we praise you, O God. We worship you. We bless your holy name, O God. Father and God, there is none to compare with you, O God, Father. Father, as we commence this service into your hands, O God, we pray for every item, O God, Father. We pray for our beloved pastor in a special way, O God, Father. You will anoint him afresh. You will have your divine way upon his life as you see it best and fit this morning, Father. For you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, O God. The same yesterday, today, and forever, O God, Father. Father and God, we pray for the worship team in a special way, O God. You will bless Brother Damien and the remaining set, O God. Anoint their voice afresh, O God, Father. Have your way upon their life as you see it best and fit this morning, O God. Father, we apply the blood of Jesus upon this compound, O God. From the pulpit to the pew, O God, you will cover this place with your blood. Wash us in your blood. Redeem us through your blood, O God, Father. Father, for you are my omnipotent Father, my omniscient God, my omnipresent Lord. Father, and for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, O God. Father, have your divine way this morning, as you see it best and fit, as we give you all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray and we ask. Amen. Welcome the worship team at this time. Give them a big round of applause, please. Thank you, Sister Nana. A pleasant good morning to everyone. So nice to see all of you here this morning. Um, we come to worship the Lord this morning, and I hope that you all came prepared. Um, let's all stand as we sing this first song. With one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Our God, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every Hallelujah is due 
all our praise, O oh God, and all our worship today. Hallelujah, because you deserve it, Lord. Hallelujah, we worship you, O oh God, and we thank you, O oh God, for who you are, Lord. For you are so good, O oh God.
And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am
and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne you are god alone sing on right now and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne you are god alone you are god oh god you are god alone oh god you're unchangeable oh god you're unfailing oh god lord you're unshakable and unstoppable oh god there is nothing that you cannot do oh god you are god alone and we praise you oh god you are the only living god oh god the only one that we worship oh god the only one that we exalt today oh god and we just lift you up oh god we just magnify the name of jesus oh god the name that is above every other name oh god we praise you oh god we praise you oh god for how great you are oh god how great is our god how great is our king oh god everlasting father oh god we praise you oh god we worship you today oh god because you deserve it oh god hallelujah we praise you oh god great is your faithfulness oh god great is your faithfulness towards us oh We praise you, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you, Father God. We just want to sing this last hymn, oh God, before we pick up the offering. us oh god we don't deserve it oh god 
We don't deserve it, oh God, Lord. But we say thank you, oh God, Lord. We are content in you, oh God. Our soul finds rest in you today, oh God. And Lord, we want to say thank you, oh God, for your faithfulness, oh God. For your goodness, oh God. For your peace, oh God, Lord. You have been our Prince of Peace, oh God, Lord. You are Jehovah Shalom, oh God. And we praise you, O oh God. We thank you today, O oh God, oh, for Lord, all that you you've so done, O oh God. You are so Lord, faithful. you are so worthy, O oh God. Hallelujah. You are so great, O oh God. Hallelujah. And we praise Hallelujah. you today, O oh God. We lift you up, God. Such a wonderful Have God. your way in this place, O oh God. We praise you, Lord. We praise you this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Have your way, Jesus. We'd like to get ready to pick up the offering this morning.
Amen. We'd like to hand over to our moderator. You all may have your seats. Hallelujah. How many of you all were blessed by the worship this morning? I want you all to give Jesus, I didn't hear, hear a round of applause. I want you all to give Jesus a big, big round of applause. Amen. We just want to thank him this morning. We are still in the land of the living. We are still here to worship him and to praise him and to exalt and to lift up his mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you, I would like you all to turn to Matthew. Chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 24 to 33. Amen? When you all find it, you can say amen. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take he thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they train. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Whereof, if God be clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. I thank God for his word this morning. You know, we're in a period where we're going through a lot of tribulations and trouble, and we're in the last and closing days. But this morning, I'm here to encourage you. Do not worry for anything. As long as you seek the Lord, he said, all these things shall be added unto you. So you don't have to worry. Just seek the Lord. Seek the, the Bible talk about seeking the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Amen? Always put God first place in your life. Never put him in the back burner. Put him in the front burner. Amen? And God will see you through. Now, I'm telling you this from experience. Sometimes you go through things in life. Your own, own, own family, your own blood sometimes take advantage of you. But I'm here this morning to tell you. You know, I was meditating on the word of God, and Sister Vanessa really, really blessed my heart. When you sing that song, I will live. And you know, whole week I'm I, I pondering in that, that verse, and I can remember exactly all the words of the song, but I keep on singing, I will live, I will live. And this morning I'm encouraging you. You could only live and live for Christ. You cannot live for mammon. You cannot live. Money cannot buy your salvation. Money cannot buy your life. You know, the, the rich man in the Bible talk about that. He had money and everything, and yet still he had to turn to Jesus and ask Jesus, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But I want to say this morning, it's only God and God alone could help you. Amen? So without any further delay, we want to call on Sister Ivana this morning, and she's coming to do a poem for us. Welcome her as she come, please. She looking beautiful this morning. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. The name of my poem is I Am What I Am. I am what I am, a child of God. He made me. I'm just another sinner who my Savior has set free. I am what I am, now that Jesus lives in me, justified and sanctified by the cross of Calvary. I am what I am, saved by mercy and grace, a new creature in my Lord, running the faithful race. I am what I am, redeemed from the enemy, delivered from the powers of darkness into light, into a light that's heavenly. I am what I am, an intimidator an in, of Jesus' life, the salt and light of the world, a laborer against man's strife. I am what I am, all my needs have been met, blessed with all spiritual blessings, for his stripes have paid my debt. I am what I am, strong in his power and might. I can do all things when I walk by faith and not by sight. I am what I am, a child of God. Jesus made me just another sinner who found grace and trusts in him for what I can see. Romans 8 verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Ivana. Amen. We thank God for this little girl. Amen. She's so brave and she's so talented. You know, I have grandchildren too, yeah, but I'm very proud of Ivana this morning. Hallelujah. The announcement is as follow. We have our Bible study and prayer meeting on Wednesday by Reverend Rishi. We want to thank God for the work that he's doing. And we are encouraging each one of you to invite a friend, come out and be here and be part of the service. And we'll be back here Sunday morning. I want to welcome Sister Amanda at this time. And she's coming to do a spoken word for us. Give her a warm welcome, please. Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody this morning? Sleepy? A little bit? <laughs> this poem is entitled, God Will Come True. You'll hear me, right? Is the answer no too hard for me to carry? Is my faith not strong enough to trust? When I walk with Christ and soon get weary, does it mean that Jesus is not just? Scripture says that I must claim the promise. It also says to ask and I'll receive. Right now, I'm walking in a deep, dark valley. What more does God want when I believe? My neighbors laugh and ridicule. They're mocking. There is no God, they say. It's no big deal. But in my heart, I know they're all mistaken. His power, his love, his care. I know he is real. Sometimes I need to thank God that his answers do not comply with all of my requests. It's God who gives the thorns and plants the roses. It's God who gives to me the very best. I might shed tears at times and feel rejected. Depression might sweep over me like a wave. But in my heart, I know I've been accepted. His constant love and mighty power can save. My soul can rest securely in his promise, even though my body racks with pain. This temporal structure will not always hold me. Some future day, I shall be made whole again. Perfect in the presence of my Savior, knowledge, wisdom, health shall all be mine. But the greatest joy will be to praise the Master, where love and peace and joy shall all entwine. Right now, I need the grace just to be faithful, to hold my head erect throughout this trial, to trust that God is cued in on my problems. He'll take me through, refined after a while. While others hiss and say, forgot, forget those notions, there is no God. You're foolish to pretend. I'll trust him, serve him, and always obey him. 
In all the world, he is my dearest friend. Amen? Thank you, Sister Amanda. Hallelujah. You know, as she said in the end, then Jesus is her best friend and all of us best friend. Amen? I want to call on Sister Patsy at this time, and she will introduce the speaker this morning. Give her a warm welcome, please. Praise the Lord. Good morning to everyone. Good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. We praise God for his word. Amen. We praise God for his presence in our midst. We thank God that we could come freely and worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Um, I'm just here to introduce the speaker this morning. We have and we are privileged to have Reverend Rishi with us this morning. And he's always willing and he's always, you know, there to give the word, no matter what. I know he studies the word, so he's always prepared to give the word this morning. So we want to welcome our Reverend Rishi Ramnath. He's coming to bring the word this morning, and I know that you will be blessed and will set on to Praise the Lord. Morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Reverend Patsy. You know, it's Carnival Sunday. It seems to be the thing that everybody throughout Trinidad and Tobago knows about. That's the one thing that's been marked on the calendar, I guess, since COVID started, and they started limiting public, um, you know, meetings and, you know, um, social gatherings and all those things. And it's a bit remarkable that the world or Trinidad or a small country or villages, wherever we're from, that's one of the things everybody seems to, to notice. You know, and the thing is that people are paying heed to what matters to their immediate temporal needs rather than their eternal needs. You know, we talk about the kingdom of heaven we talk about, you know, um, what matters. But as Christians, do we really focus on what matters? Uh, do we have it in perspective? Sometimes when we do or keep ourselves at an inventory check, you know, what is important in my life right now? What are the things I value the most? Does it come out to be Jesus Christ? Is it the pursuit um, of, of wealth? Is it uh, my career? Is it uh, my job? Is it, um, you know, how I look, my prestige? Um, how I look in front of my peers? What do we hold most? Esteem. And today I want to just, um, you know, focus on that a little bit. Uh, I'm speaking from the book of Isaiah. And before I, I, I get in it, I want to just say a quick prayer. And if you all would just bow and agree with me. Oh Lord my God, I give you praise, I give you honor, I glorify your name, I exalt you above all else. Father, I worship you, God, for your faithfulness, I worship you for your goodness unto us, my God, through Jesus Christ, through what he has done, that we may be saved, that we can call ourselves redeemed, not through our own works, but because of your goodness, of your grace, of your mercy, of what you have done, oh Lord God, for us. I thank you and I bless you in no other name but by the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, while I was praying, as, you know, I mentioned the faithfulness of God. And um, we sung, probably I think it's just part of a verse or the chorus of this song, It is well with my soul. Um, how many of you know the song itself, just by show of hands? Uh, how many of you know the history of the person that actually wrote the hymn? Um, I believe it's a guy called Paul Bless. Not much. It Is Well With My Soul was written by a, a guy named Paul Bless. He was, a, I believe he was an attorney. Very popular, made a lot of money. I believe it was the 18th century. He lost his, the majority of his belongings in a fire that occurred. He lost uh, his four-year-old boy 
in a sickness. Um, I can't remember the name of the illness itself. And having taught to make a new start probably in a new country, he had his family shipped off to the States where four of his children and his wife perished on the journey to the States because the boat that they were traveling and the ship, it sank. Yet this person was able to write a song, It Is Well With My Soul. Think about that regarding his relationship with the Lord. After enduring the death of your youngest, your entire family, all that you possess, what was your stance and perspective on life despite everything? It is well with what? My soul. These songs may be old. These songs may be considered very religious, but it's a reason why. It's rooted not upon the character of the person that wrote it, but upon the word of God. David said it, it is well with my soul. Why was it well with his soul? Because of his relationship with the Lord. My confidence is not based on who. Not who I am. My confidence is based on who God is. That is the one I boast upon. Do I boast on how well I look? Do I boast upon what I have? Or do I boast upon the goodness of who? God. Who's God? My God. It's a difference. It's not just God. He's our God. That's the boast in it. He is ours. He's not anybody else's. Yes, he's yours. But he's mine's as well. He is my God. It's something that I must take ownership of. It's something that I must have responsibility for. He is what? My God. He is the person I look to. And before I continue going on a separate message... I want to stick and just get back to my landing scripture. My landing scripture today is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 19. Now, this is a scripture that we are, again, all familiar with, but it's something I want to touch on. Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 19. It says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Now, before I get into it, I want to shed and explain the context of this because a lot of people use this message and, 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 and spin it into just a prosperity gospel. And although it does have a measure of prosperity in it, my concern with it is not necessarily the, the perspective of prosperity that is promised, but it more focuses upon your relationship with God. Because Righteousness to God is not based upon prosperity. It's based on Jesus Christ and repentance and coming to him for the remission of our sins. Amen? That is the focus on it. A byproduct of that relationship would be prosperity. It is not the end result. Many people look to these scriptures and land it as, well, in order to be prosperous, I just need to seek the Lord. No. In seeking the Lord, prosperity comes. But that is not the goal. That is not the aim. The aim of it is to have a long-standing relationship with the Lord. That is what he has called for. And a byproduct of that will be what? Prosperity. There will be peace. There will be joy. There will be what is known as the fruits of the Spirit. So I want to make that abundantly clear. Because I don't want to spin this into something that the gospel doesn't say. Amen? So it says about eating the good of the land. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Now the best context I can place this in, because we live in a world where most things are visual, and it's pretty obvious, I love food. So the easiest thing I can bring, bring this to, because we're talking in the context of eating the good of the land, if we were to visit a fast food restaurant, we're going to buy something, a KFC or a Royal Castle, or if we were just to go right up the road by, um, by this chicken and chips place, Nabs. Everybody know about it? Next to the mosque? It's really good. Not advertising for them, but, you know, 
It's good. So we go in there to buy something. Now when we go there to buy something, there's a couple things that we do. And I want to use this illustration and draw it back a little bit regarding our spiritual inventory check regarding the Lord. When we go to that place, first of all, we must have the resource of money. Anybody know to any place that you could go or any fast food place and tell them I want something and they'll give it to you without money? Very unlikely. You have to pay. So first of all, in order to, to actually buy food at any place, you must have money, which is a resource. The resource and the capacity for money must be present. Amen? Second of, it, of this, there must be, when you go to any place, you must abide with the rules of the establishment. You can't go dress anyhow. There's at least a very minimum dress code. You can't go brandishing a weapon. You can't go behave in a certain way. More than likely, what happens? Security will throw you out or they will refuse to serve you. So it's, it is required, at least for any patron, that there is an obedience or an adherence to the rules of the establishment. Amen? So there's obedience, there's resources, there's attitude. This is known with any KFC, I guess internationally. I don't think it's just in Trinidad. If you go there with an attitude to order, what's, no, what's the normal consequence of it? You'll get an attitude back from the person that's taking the order. That's kind of like the cultural norm. You know, you go very pleasant and polite. Sometimes they may address you pleasant and polite. But most times, if you go with an attitude, they'll give you back an attitude. Isn't that the way of the world? Or what do we learn by it? Our attitude in dealing with people has to be cordial. We have to have the right attitude in order to probably get the best service. Amen? When, thanks for that, Sister Patsy. So, in order to, to, to get what we want, we must have the right attitude. Now, after we make our purchase, we receive our items, our food, time to eat. But before you do that, what do you normally say to the cashier? Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, just yesterday, um, I, um, I carried my daughter for, um, just for ice cream somewhere. And, you know, just practicing some of these things, it's an ice cream place. So because of that, you know, the, the, they're very stringent. So if you ask for things like extra napkins and stuff, it's usually something they kind of tell you, okay, we just rational want a person or something like that. Um, I asked the guy, I said, um, could I have a, a napkin? He gave me like three at once. And the point I'm drawing at is that based on your attitude and your gratitude of when you receive your item, it will establish that there may be after sales service or there may be a continued um, respect, there may be a continued flow of what is received. You know, it's just not just the food, but... You get, okay, I need extra condiments. I just need a cup with some ice. We will get it. Normally, we do, and it isn't a problem. Now, this happens just with, if you go to just buy fast food, a $25, $35 box of food or whatever floats your boat. The point is that it, the law remains the same. If we were to apply those same thing, just with the things that are applicable to the Lord, regarding our obedience, regarding our attitude, regarding our gratitude, regarding using and seeing him as our resource, our life will be in a so much better place. This scripture at Isaiah points towards some of those points of, you, of seeing God as a resource. Seeing God as a resource, not using him as a resource. The difference being is that we just don't come to God when we need something. We see him, we see the Lord, we see him as a person, we develop a relationship with him. We don't simply say, Lord, I only come into you because I need X, Y, Z, and I know that you are good and I know that you are faithful. Is that the right way to approach the Lord? Only when we need things? If you as a person, somebody, only comes to you when they need something, 
Does that sound like somebody that can be called a friend? What do we call them in local? They're, they're like a user, they, they, they just want things. Those are the first persons when you look around your social circle that you want to abandon quickly because they aren't genuine. They just want what's in it for themselves. How do the Lord see us when we approach him? David says, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. You know what that means? When we seek the Lord, yes, we come to him with a clean heart, but renew the right spirit in me. Because if it isn't present, Lord, make it in me. Create it in me. Teach me that I may come to you knowing you, not knowing myself who I want you to be, that I may know who you fully are, know who you truly are. When we pray to the Lord, do we know the Lord? Do we understand when I say, Father, I come to you, who we are coming before? Do we understand it's the one that sits on the eternal throne? Do we understand that when we cry out to the Lord God Almighty, it is the Lord God Almighty, there is no one else. We aren't saying, Lord, I come to you because you are holy. We are coming to him because he alone is holy. There is no one else. Holiness is only found in the Lord and nowhere else. When we say we come to you, Lord, because you are righteous, it's not because righteousness is found anywhere else. It is only because he alone is righteous. These are not just statements of my opinion. These are factual statements, and it makes a difference. Because when you understand and you know these things, it shapes your relationship with the Lord. When you say, Lord, you are my confidence, you are my tower, you are the one I believe in, it's not just a statement of, of, of opinion, it's a fact. When David says, it is well with my soul, Lord, you are my confidence. Lord, it is you who are my tower. You think David was saying that because he didn't know? David was saying that because it has been proven. So when we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, you are my God, you are my protector, you are my fortress, you are the Holy One, you are the one that sits on the eternal throne, guess what? Our relationship should be so that when we say that, we know that. It isn't just what we read in the Word enough. It's what we know, what has been proven upon our lives, which is why our lives should bear what? A testimony of who we are in the Lord. Because based on our testimony, guess what? We have that relationship with the Lord. It isn't isolated. It flows your relationship with the Lord flows into your life. And from your life, guess what? The abundance that flows is a testimony of the glory of God. It doesn't work that way where people believe I want something and I only go to the Lord and when he provides it for me, that's it. And I've said this and I say it with all due respect. I believe it's an applicable term. And again, I say this with all due respect, but Hosea said it best in the book of Hosea, but... My God is no man's prostitute. You can see the Lord only for when you want something and that's it. If you read the book of Hosea, that's what the Lord begs Israel to not see him as. Israel was so unfaithful. Israel was so demeaning to the Lord. And we can look down at them and say, you know what? Israel was so foolish and Israel was so re unrepentant and Israel was so stiff-necked. But here's the harsh reality check. Compare ourselves to Israel. Do we follow? Do we have the same patterns? Do we have the same trend? And it's not a question I can look to you and say, you, you, and you. It's a question of introspection. You have to ask yourself that. I can't. It's something that, as Christians, we all need to do. We all need to look within and say, you know what? Lord, am I truly serving you? Holy Spirit, are you there? You think it's not important that we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit today? Greater is he that is what? Within me than he that is what? In the world. Who resides on the seat of our heart? Jesus by the representation of Jesus and by the manifestation of the triune God, it represents the Holy Spirit that guides us, that teaches us in all things. This is so very important. Samson, with all his might and all his great power that Samson had, Samson did not know when the Holy Spirit left him. 
Everybody here familiar with the story of Samson? One of the strongest men that, um, that ever lived. Um, he, had, he carried, he followed what was called the Nazareth vow. Uh, he grew his hair long, didn't you know, um, shave or anything like that. And God said as long as he kept those vows, he will have the strength. And the strength will be, based, will be upon him once the Holy Spirit is there. Once he kept his vessel, his body pure, his, his mind clean. Samson defiled it by sleeping with Delilah. And not only that, he also gave away the source of his strength, which was his hair. Now, what's so very important, again, is to repeat this point. Samson, and when you read the Bible, it says that Samson knew not when the Holy Spirit departed him. You know what a sad state that is when you as a Christian don't know that the Holy Spirit is not there? Because this is something we rely on every day, you know, every minute. We speak to God, we, we follow the directions, things are brought to our remembrance by way of the Holy Spirit. If you aren't praying, if you aren't seeking the Lord, if there's not a revelation every day, start taking check. Lord, something is not right. Lord, I need help. Lord, look to my heart, strengthen me. And this is the point we want to get to. Don't think, you know what, my day just has peace in it and that's it. We don't need peace. We need more than that. And if you just abide in and just peace and joy, then you are simply seeking the Lord for what you can get, not building a relationship to Him. And this is the point of it, to build a relationship with the Lord. How do I know this? Look at Genesis. From the book of Genesis, man was created to be what? A companion unto God. To have fellowship with the Lord. To speak with the Lord. The Bible says in the cool of the day, what? The Lord would walk among the garden. And Adam and Eve, well, mostly Adam, would speak to him. Now the point being drawn back to all of this, our relationship with the Lord. And our relationship with the Lord is more than just prayer. Our relationship with the Lord is more than just doing our relationship with the Lord should be beyond that. Has to be not just our relationship with just knowing Him in word, knowing Him in deeds, but knowing Him within. The Holy Spirit that guides, that teaches, that shows, that reveals unto us who He is. And it's so very important that we understand and that we follow and that we look to Him. You all with me, amen? So this scripture says, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. No, no, you could just go back. If ye be willing and obedient. Those are two different things. Many times we'll read it and say, you know what, it's one of the same. If ye be willing. When you're willing to do something, that shows of your position. You are willing. You have no problems against doing something. But being obedient to something is completely different. Being obedient could very well mean that I want to do this and I will put my heart into doing something. Let me give a very practical and a very real and a very embarrassing example. My wife says, you know what? I want you to do the dishes. I don't like doing the dishes for anything, but I'll do it. I'm willing, but I could bet my last dollar it's not going to be the best dishwashing you're going to get. I just don't like to do it. Now, yeah, I am willing to do it as my wife, I'll listen. But obedience really isn't in it because my heart not into washing dishes. I have never liked washing dishes. Amen. <laughs> You're going to know about that a little more just now. <laughs> now, that just refers to willingness. Obedience now refers to our hearts being in it. And this speaks with regard to our relationship with the Lord more practically. We are willing to listen to what the Lord has to say. In fact, I could come up here and I could quote the Ten Commandments and you will hear it. But here's the difference. Would we obey it? Now you could hear it, and you'd be willing to hear it. It would not throw an offense. 
but are you obedient? Are you submissive? Because obedience has to do with submission. And there's a big difference. Let me just pull this scripture reference. I want to show how big a difference it is with willingness and obedience. In fact, it's, I believe it's in the book of Samuel. Okay, turn to 1 Samuel 15, 23. Now, the context of this scripture occurs when Saul disobeys Samuel's instructions and he did not wait on the prophet of the Lord and he did his own thing. And Samuel said, had the Lord, and this is Samuel talking unto Saul, and Samuel said, had the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, to hearken the fat of rams. Next verse. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he had also rejected thee from being king. Now, keep this, no, no, right there. Keep it there for a minute. It talks about rebellion and stubbornness. In the other verse, it speaks prior to that about willingness and obedience. You see the exact contrast of what's being explained here? When you don't operate to the will of the Lord, what is it seen as? Rebellion. And it says rebellion is as, or is as equal to the sin of witchcraft. Now again, how many of you know the Lord? For I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God but me. If you have a relationship with the Lord, you know how serious witchcraft is unto the Lord. You have another God. You don't see the Lord as God. There is another. Your faithfulness is not unto the Lord. The Lord sees this as something, quote-unquote, detestable unto him. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. This is how serious the Lord sees it. When you don't obey. You know why? Obedience is rooted into the submission of the Lord. But when you don't obey, guess what? Whether we see it or not, the truth about it is that we usurp God's authority for our own. We are telling God, and we may not realize it, but by our actions, what we do is more important than what you want. And what I will and what I perceive and what I want to do, I will do because I am my own person. In short, you are telling God, I am my own God. I am my own authority. That's how serious this is. And people don't seem to realize it. You are telling God, your authority, you can say what you want, but I will do as I want. This is when we, and we may not realize it, when we are disobedient to the word of the Lord, how serious it is. Because we don't feel the tangible effects. We don't immediately see something going wrong. Because the way as humans we learn is when we do something and it's wrong and we see the effects of it immediately, then we know it's wrong. Amen? But if we don't, we often think, well, everything's okay because nothing changed. My life's going good. But these things are temporal. Things may be going good right now. But in eternity, there is a change. And whether we see it or not, That is the true reality of things. That is, unfortunately, the harsh reality of things. Many people right now that walk the face of this earth are oblivious to what they do affects their eternal life. We have a privilege right here of knowing what we do impacts our eternal life. And this is why we are here. This is why we submit. Not because, you know what, we have nothing else to do. We understand There is a freedom, there is an obedience, there is a holiness, there is a calling of righteousness in following the Lord that cannot be found anywhere else. This is why we are here. And if you are not here because any of those reasons, I pray that you will find it. Because the truth about it is, that is finding the Lord. And we should be in a place where if we haven't found it, we are urgently, ardently seeking it. So it speaks about the sin of witchcraft. What else does it say? And stubbornness. What is it to be stubborn? 
to be unwilling to change. You have, have you ever had the opportunity? I've worked with an old school person. When I say old school, this person has been doing something for the last, I think it's 35 years, and they will continue to do it despite what you tell them. You know, I'm like, hey, you know what? You need to submit a leave form so I can sign it off before you go on leave. Yeah, that person will go on leave, come back the next day, and despite you send it an email, in writing, and whatever, it doesn't happen. And not because the person is really trying to be disrespectful, not understanding your authority. It's that the person is stubborn. Or in short, the person can't change or refuses to change. Because this is the way it has always been done. Stubbornness is like that. Stubbornness is saying, I don't need to change. Why I don't need to change? Because I don't think what you're telling me makes sense. I don't think what has to be done needs to be done because it's working fine my way. Well, I can testify where I've tried to live life my way and I could say that it didn't work. I mean, by the standards of money, it probably was working, but by the standards of God, it wasn't. You could have all the money in the world, you could have the best privileges and the best of everything, yet at the end of the day, when you look and you are faced before the throne of God, you see the foolishness of everything that we pursue and we hold high. The best car in the world, the best house in the world, the fattest bank account, the best job title, the best education means nothing. If at the end of the day, when you stand, you don't stand be before the throne of God with favor. What profits a man to gain the whole world and what? Lose his soul. You know the whole point of that is? The world does not profit if you lose your soul. Because that is what Jesus died for. God sent the most precious, limited resource that he had, his son, so that we may be saved. And you tell me that you're telling God, you will do what you want? Think about what I'm saying, and I'm not trying to be offensive when I'm saying it. Look at it from that perspective. We could not purchase freedom. We could not have our sins removed, if not for Jesus Christ. Yet we are still saying to God, I don't want it. That's stubbornness. That has a lot to do with understanding our relationship with God and believing more so that we need him and we need that effect to be changed upon us. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, it says the word of the Lord, he had also rejected thee from being king. God sees rebellion and stubbornness as a complete attack on his authority. Do we see when we fall short in sin, when we don't look to the Lord, when we do our own thing? Do we see it as that? Or do we see it as, you know what, I won't do it today and tomorrow, I'll, I'll change. But here's the problem with that. Tomorrow is promise to no man. I can say right now, you know what, I've done X, Y, Z in the past. And I can say that with confidence because I have done it. But I can't say, hey, you know what, tomorrow I will do this. Because tomorrow isn't mine. The only person that owns the past, present, and the future is who? The Lord. I am Alpha. I am Omega. I am the one who is and was and is to come. There is no other but me. Why is this important? Because again, your relationship with the Lord would allow you to know who he is. The book of Micah, chapter 7, verses 18 to 20.
I'll just read ahead just in the interest of um, time. Book of Micah, chapter 7, verses 18 to 20. Those of you with your Bibles. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn away. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy of Abraham. And thou hast sworn unto the fathers from the days of old. Previous. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will what? Subdue our iniquities. He will cast all all their sins into the depths of the sea. Who will do it? Will we do it? Who will do it? He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Next verse. Thou will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy of to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. This is the faithfulness of God since Jacob and Abraham. Since those generations ago, the Lord has not changed. His perspective, his view, his dealings with man has not changed. He will forgive. He will change. He will remove our iniquities. He will cast them away to be remembered no more. Now, as Christians, we all know this. But here's the thing to look to. Uh, this, when we go back to our land, in verse 1 Isaiah 1, 19, If ye will be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. Willing and obedient. Are we willing to serve the Lord? Are we obedient to His word? If we are, then we will eat of the good of the land. And eating the good of the land isn't an immediate promise. It's a conditional promise. Because our relationship builds with having obedience and willingness to serve. And out of that relationship, the abundance of prosperity flows. Very important that we recognize this. Very important that it's said right now, over the last couple of years, through COVID, some people still haven't recovered over the effects of some of the things that occurred during those couple of years. Whether it may be within our finances, within our bodies, within relationships or jobs, whatever it may be. But if you are obedient, if you are willing, if you place your trust upon the Lord, He will work it out for you. And I want to put that word upon your hearts today. Not my words, the words of the Lord. I want you to trust it. I want you to remember it during this week. Obedience and willingness. Ye shall eat of the good of the land. It's his word, it's his promise. It's the one who has been faithful from the days of Abraham, from the days of Jacob. That has been willing to cast away our iniquities and sin into the depths of the sea. Because of his mercy, because of who he is. Amen? So I want to ask, as I close, those of you that may need prayer, um, if, you wanna, um, if you need prayer for anything specifically, I want to invite you to come up to the altar. If there's for some reason upon your heart, um, there's any sin, there's any shortcomings, there's somebody you need praying for, whether it's family, whether it's relatives, whether it's a situation, I want you just to, to come up and just let me um, just say a couple of words of, um, of prayer. Is there anyone? If not, I will um, close in prayer. Oh Lord, my God, I give you praise. I give you honor. 
And I glorify your name, my God, for you are good, you are gracious, you are righteous above all else. For there is no one else who is like unto you, my God. Father, I pray as we come to you, my God, as we look to you, my God, I pray and ask, O Lord God, create in us a clean heart, impart righteousness unto us, my God. And Father, may we, O God, be willing, may we be obedient, may we have the right spirit renewed within us, my God, to seek you, to seek your face, to seek your ways, my God, that we may develop a relationship with you, my God, that we, Father, may put everything else aside and prioritize you as first and foremost in our lives, my God. Father, where we may promote ourselves, where we may promote the things of us, my God, may we move aside personal agendas, my God, and seek you, my God. May we seek life, O Lord God, and not pursue the path of death, my God. May our bodies, O Lord God, be submissive, O Lord God. I pray and I ask in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, O Lord God, the struggles that, is, that are before us, my God, whether the vices, O Lord God, or situation or circumstances or challenges of health or families or relationships, my God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you, O Lord, my God, be our deliverer, that you be our savior, that you go before us, my God, break chains, break strongholds, O Lord, my God, that we are redeemed and we are saved. I ask in no other name but by the name of Jesus, that you, O Lord, my God, will be our Savior, that you will be our Deliverer, that you will be present within our hearts, O Holy Spirit, to guide, to teach, to reveal to us, as we ask that, Father, teach us to be sensitive as you speak to our hearts, that we may move, O Lord God, that we may be obedient. I ask in the name of Jesus that your Comforter, O Lord God, be upon us. O oh Lord, have your way, my God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, uh, may the Lord bless you all. We are dismissed.